welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. Uh, and we're in touch with uh, Carlos Suarez, who is the, I guess, the principal of this show. <laughs> and it's, uh, this is about global connections. Today, we're talking about America's standing in the world and how it took a big hit on election night. And it's taking a big hit today on counting day. Uh, so hi, Carlos. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, Jay. It's a great to connect. And I apologize. I've got a little bit of a weaker connection today and a poor lighting and just not the best of all situations, but uh, we will do our best. I, I certainly hope you can hear me, but I'm yes. always, always excited to reconnect. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit in particular as well about some of the foreign perspectives or how the world is seeing this uh, U.S. election unfold, because the world is watching. This is an election that has tremendous repercussions, not just for the U.S. politics, of course, but really for the world. Uh, the U.S. as a global power, global leader, and uh, needless to say, the world is looking like many of us uh, in shock or, or at least confusion, the chaos, uh, all the you know, bewilderment. Uh, it's a very messy process. And so looking at it from the outside, it's there. But we'll, we'll unravel more. What are the implications for, let's say, the future of the U.S. role in the world, its foreign policy and relations with so many parts of the world? Everybody is interested to see what's going to happen. And yet here we are still living in the midst of this uh, very messy process. It's a democracy in action, ugly, kind of like that, that, that metaphor when you, you don't want to know how they make the sausage. It tastes so good. Uh, <laughs> it, when you start opening up the umbrella, you know, the hood of the Pennsylvania electoral laws. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves that we are really seeing 50 separate elections that are happening that are all coming together to take on this indirect election of the U.S. president. It, also, that's a system that is not common in the world. You know, most places, certainly most democracies, you have a vote, you count the ballots, and the one that has the most wins. I mean, obviously, a little more than that, but you, you do use majority uh, popular votes for the most part. The U.S. does not. And it's a That's quirk. interesting. We, we invented you know? the system. Yes. And we, we are invented the, democracy. Exactly. We're the oldest continually existing democracy. And for many, many years, and uh, gosh, for most of our history, the world has looked to the U.S. as a beacon of hope and inspiration. Today, they are bewildered and, and, and obviously a little more... Uh, skeptical and, and well, confused. <laughs> so there you have it. But I think, you know, let me, let me throw this thought at you. We, we have uh, a country where hmm, roughly half or very close to half of the people in the country have voted against their own interest. They have voted, uh, they have voted for somebody who has singularly failed to deal with COVID. They have voted for somebody who has been a racist, uh, an isolationist, um, a disaster in terms of international trade, a disaster in terms of the economy, uh, who has been mean and who has lied to us 22,000 times. Uh, we have voted for a guy who has uh, essentially wrecked the economy um, and um, or all our institutions. We have voted for somebody who, uh, the Latinos have voted for uh, somebody who has been anti-Latino, anti-immigration. Um, it's, it's clearly for most people, if not nearly all of them who have voted for Trump, it's against their interest. And I, I don't think we see that. Or, I mean, I do, you do, but I, I don't think that that half of the country sees that they're voting against their own interest. But here's the point. Outside the U.S., if they've been reading the paper and watching television, and they have, they can make that conclusion. And they can say, gee, this is a remarkable phenomenon. Half the people in the country are voting for somebody who's going to take away their benefits, who's going to make life worse for them. Uh, and they cannot, they understand that. It's clear enough. But they can't, they can't understand why. And, and that's the remarkable thing. I mean, we don't look so good, a country which votes against its own interest. Well, Jay, I mean, here, I, I, I you know, I certainly uh, appreciate and even share your views, but I will tell you that that may not be something that many will agree with. And, and what do I mean by that? Of course, you know, there are different reasons people will choose to vote for Trump. And it is astonishing that 68 million Americans will. However, again, I would say it's not a single monolithic vote. Some of them are voting because of him over certain narrow interests, maybe a very conservative evangelical who prefers his choice for Supreme Court justices, or he's going to defend that narrow interest of, you know, abortion rights, or, or I'm sorry, well, I guess anti-abortion, and on and on. I mean, um, but no doubt the world is bewildered because, yes, in some ways, uh, 
uh, politicians in many other democratic systems usually come in through, you know, the more traditional route as politicians. Donald Trump is almost exemplifies this American entertainment industry. You know, he was a reality TV star, uh, although of course a business person as well. Uh, and yet, at least in many of the democratic systems of Europe, uh, it would be unlikely that you would see someone like him get through. Uh, so there's that element. Other than that, I mean, again, uh, I think what we are left with is uh, uh, unprecedented on so many levels, both just the sheer outcome, uh, surprising, also the largest participation rate we're going to probably see in 120 years. Uh, so Americans came forward to vote in large droves. Let me clarify, you mentioned the, the, the Latino vote. They certainly helped him in South Florida win Florida, but we're going to wait and see the outcome. Don't, don't forget in Texas. Uh, and, and some in Texas too. Uh, I think what it's going to help us dispel is this idea that we often hear, the Latino vote. Well, it's guess what? It is about as diverse as America as a whole. And so you have a small percentage that are voting for Trump. And, and I say that because the Cuban Americans are an anomaly. Most I understand, I understand that. It's, it's uh, you know, it's not- uh, Monolithic. Not just one, one set of views, but on the other hand, um, he has marginalized them, he has threatened them. He has done terrible things to Latinos in and out of the country. You'd think there would be some perception of that, some understanding of that. Uh, why in the world would they vote for him? What has he done for them? Nothing. He has only beat them up. Uh, I find it remarkable that he could reach them at all. And yet he has. Well, again, uh, I would just say this. I mean, you have, let's say, uh, a Texas Latino who is by now fully assimilated, Americanized, and they have values that are no different from that Republican Texan. Uh, concern over the you know, migration more as an illegal issue, law and order, da da in other words, there are conservative Latinos, uh, and they are thinking just as any other conservative American. Their, their interest is not necessarily their own Latino identity. Many Latinos in the U.S. do not speak Spanish anymore. They're you know, essentially Americanized, and increasingly those become just reflecting interests and values that are more typical. They're, they're in, that's very different from a recently arrived immigrant who obviously you know, will have a different set of values. Um, but maybe, again, uh, I would just add this too. I mean, uh, one of the puzzles that we continue to see is the U.S. and it, the erosion of its, uh, its role in the world community because traditionally the U.S. has been uh, the architect of the international system. It has been the leader of the you know, international multilateral system. And today that image and that perception is gone. Uh, the U.S. Under, under President Trump obviously accelerated that. It was a process already happening in the post-Cold War period we saw the U.S kind of retrenching somewhat, and also dealing with a changing world, the rise of China, the rise of the EU, the rise of other you know, regional interests and emerging powers. And today, now the US, especially, I guess what I want to suggest here is given the chaos of this election right now, it just sort of helps to push further uh, a very poor image of the US uh, as a place that doesn't have its act together. Um, here we are in a worldwide pandemic, and what does the US under Trump do? Announces that it's going to exit the World Health Organization. I mean, by what rational uh, explanation can you say that? Trump says it's because the Chinese are controlling it. Well, no, uh, the pandemic is a global issue that requires coordination, cooperation. It requires a multilateral effort to develop the vaccine, to you know, distribute it, to make sure that the developing world. And all, meanwhile, the United States is basically missing in action and, and not at the table. Well, so I, you know, if I were somebody living in Europe, let's say, and I read the papers and watched the TV, and I saw that the U.S. was spiking worse than ever before. What's 100,000 cases per day now and getting worse? Um, uh, extraordinary, okay? And he, he quits the uh, World Health Organization. He, re he disregards uh, the most authoritative um, you know, experts in epidemiology. Uh, he picks a radiologist to advise him. Um, I mean, move after move, and he talks about herd immunity, which nobody believes in. Um, and so what I get is, if, if I'm in Europe, if I'm sitting there in France or Germany or name any country in the EU, and I see this happening, and I do, I see this happening, it's all available. I say, this is irrational. And, and not only is he, not only is he, is he the president, having been elected in 2016, but... It, you know, he had a good percentage, no matter how you calculate it, nearly half of the people in the country agree with him. So what are they, what are they likely to conclude? 
he's irrational. That's obvious to everyone in the world. And then the, the country agrees with him. So the conclusion I would make in France or Germany or anywhere in the EU, um, so advised, I would say the country is irrational. The country is on this huge, big, sweeping decline, maybe irreversible decline. Isn't it so? Well, it is a widely shared view, it's certainly very common among the elite that are more plugged in and those that are, let's say, politically savvy, because again, he's an enigma. This would not be likely in Europe. Beyond that, I mean, I, I would say that just like the US, I mean, the average person, you know, the baker that's toiling away here, their interests are not, not so much that. Instead, they know from their history, and by and large, most Europeans do have a more historical context. I, as you well know, yeah, I, I, as a college teacher, I teach students in US and Europe and in Mexico, and Europeans by and large, of all types, even if you're a business student, you have a pretty good understanding of the historical context. And I say that because often in the US we don't. Most Americans just don't understand what the international you know, liberal order refers to. It's not, you know, uh, and, and, and whereas Europeans will, so they are bewildered, yes, and they look at this and it erodes the image. So I think there's a generational change today. The Europeans of now are not looking at the Europe of their grandparents uh, because certainly uh, after World Wars I and II, the United States you know, it gained quite a bit of support from Europeans uh, who saw the U.S., you know, come to their rescue, help develop and build those countries. Uh, today, the U.S. does not have that image. And uh, we talked in our previous show, Jay, about the plummeting image of the U.S. And, and it's, a, it's been obviously accelerated under Trump. But we have to, again, repeat this. He didn't bring it. It wasn't something, uh, you know, somehow that just begun with him. He simply accelerated this process, obviously taking it faster and deeper and you know, just uh, in ways that are unprecedented. Uh, even as we think of the time when he may be gone, assuming he loses now, he'll be no longer president. The reality is that look, half the population is voting for him and what he represents. And so those issues are gonna remain divided in the country. It's a polarized nation. And yeah, I think as you suggested a minute ago, I mean, the world is looking and you know, shaking their heads like, oh my gosh, how can we move forward with this? Uh, that aside, I mean, if we do have a transition to a Biden presidency, it will be a, an important task and it will not be immediate or overnight, but there will be an effort to try to go back and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, let's, uh, let's re-engage. Well, I, I like to talk about that with you. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. Take my hypothetical Mr. Potato Man, Frenchman or German, reading the American newspapers, looking at the websites, watching all the MSNBC, what have you, okay, and he sees what's going on in here. He, he sees uh, how, how we have utterly failed to deal with COVID. He sees uh, this ineffectual, useless trade war. Um, he sees the lies. The, he hears about the 22,000 lies. Um, you know, he sees all these you know, failures, a failure of checks and balances, a failure of the rule of law. He sees all this and he says, oh, you know, the American system is declining. We better put our our marbles somewhere else. We better, you know, connect up somewhere else or find a way to replace the American participation in the world order some other way. But then now Biden wins. Knock wood, that's going to happen like today. Uh, there'll be litigation and all, but there's no, there's no real indication that it needs to be turned over. It's not going to be turned over, knock wood. Biden will be the president, okay? Now Biden's got, he, he inherits the problem. Many, many, many problems. We could go on all day just listing the problems. Now my hypothetical Mr. Potato Man in, uh, in, in France or, or, or Germany is, is watching Biden like a hawk because um, Biden is the, is the savior. Let's see if Biden can fix this because if he can, then we know that we were right uh, to keep on believing in America. In our hearts, we, we kept on believing in America. But if Biden fails, and Trump will do everything he can, and, and, and uh, Mitch McConnell will do everything he can to make Biden fail, then my European person is going to say, they're really sunk. You know, the, 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 the better guy won for president. He's a reasonable man. And he can't lead this country either. They're done. They're toast. We, we have to turn our backs on them now if we are to survive in our own new world order. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, it is a view I think that uh, some will have. Uh, I, I would say that while Biden will certainly be 
first many of the actions try to you know move quickly to improve those ties the erosion of, of let's say the image and the trust is something you simply can't you can't paper over it so it will be hard to for the u.s to go back to where it might have been but i think that's necessary the u.s is no longer the global superpower it once was. I mean, it's still the largest military, largest economy, okay, no doubt, but it's playing in a different world. There are different geopolitics, different dynamics. Now, having said that, I certainly believe as an internationalist, a global, you know, globally connected person, the United States needs to be engaged in the world. It needs to be, a, you know, with a seat at the table. It needs to be collaborating and cooperating. And there's so much that it can offer and, 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 and it just needs to be there. But it needs to be there in a more realistic way, more humble, more with a seat at the larger table and not with you know, the taller seat or the dominant seat. And that's not easy. The US has a, obviously a long history as a superpower, as a you know, big bully, and it is not easy. They I think the US has to come forward now in a more uh, humble way. Um, but responsible. And, and uh, again, you know, it's going to be a challenge. I like anything. When you have broken trust, it doesn't happen overnight. So the actions will begin to define that. Uh, under Biden, we will probably see immediately reconnecting to the Iran deal, rejoining, you know, the uh, Paris uh, Climate Accord. He said he would do that right away, um, holding back and reversing a lot of uh, what Trump has done. Now, that's, again, that's going to be seen positively by many abroad. Uh, but Beyond that, I think there's probably already a recognition that the U.S. is no longer going to be the reliable partner, uh, the partner that's going to be the dominant one. And yes, increasingly they're looking elsewhere, whether it's the Europeans looking to partner with, you know, the Russians or the Chinese or the Latin Americans and vice versa, everyone else. From Mexico, where I've been now these past years, a long time, there is certainly a growing awareness that the U.S., as difficult as it has been, you know, forces us to look elsewhere, to look to Asia, to look to South America, to look to Europe. But unfortunately for Mexico, at the end of the day, the U.S. is the big, big, big neighbor. It, it, it's going to always be its most important external factor, but it doesn't mean that they're not looking more. And I think everybody is today looking elsewhere. And the U.S. has to step into that reality. Again, I say this word with more humility to engage but to show through its actions that it is committed and interested and, and, and it values you know, democracy versus non-democracy. Unfortunately with Trump, we have seen the erosion of democratic norms and values. Uh, it is not unique to the US. We've seen the same happen in Hungary and Poland and uh, you know, other uh, countries in Europe, um, particularly those. And this is simply part of the same, or even you know, the, the chaos in Brexit uh, in the UK, very similar to the Trump story, it's a grievance, it's a frustration, it's a you know, changing identity, all of these. And it's very complex because some of what's happening in the US, as you know, Jay, is racial inequality and injustice. Uh, and that's something that the world is also seeing with bewilderment because the United States is in many ways a model of a country that had you know, terrible race relation problems, massive you know, uh, reform, what, 50, 60 years ago with you know, civil rights movement which inspired many other social movements around the world as well. And, you know, leaders like Martin Luther King have long been, you know, idolized and venerated throughout the world. Uh, today, I think uh, the world looks at the U.S. bewildered, you know, with the tremendous police violence and, and the racial riots. Uh, so it, it, it has, I think, left many people bewildered, uh, confused. Yeah, well, let's, let's, go, let's go to a negotiating table. Uh, say, um, trade deal, um, health deal, who knows what, in Europe. And Biden, President Biden's got his man there, or woman, representing him, maybe the United Nations, you know. And um, while, while this individual is telling them that it's a new deal now, we're going to do the right thing, we're going to try to be reasonable and humble and, and reconnect with you, um, there's Trump back home making trouble making trouble on uh, conservative radio, making trouble in the streets, uh, you know, tr sending out dog whistles to skinheads and, you know, militia, whatnot. And it's in the paper. So the fellows at the table, right opposite the American representative, they say, well, you know, thank you for your humility and thank you for trying to reconnect and, and patch up the relationship, you know, that we, we lost when Trump was elected. But what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about the trouble in the U.S.? 
It sounds to us like it's simply more of the same. And you don't have the clout come here and say those things because the real America is so divided that you'll never get your act together. What is the, what does our U.S. representatives say at this international nexus? Well, first, I would say the typical European diplomat is not going to meddle and in, in probably say that, especially if they're you know in a more formal setting. But that aside, I, I would say this: I mean, Europe has its own right-wing populism raging in many places. So you know, it doesn't take more than just look around the corner and see that. We've seen it rising in Italy, in Spain, in Greece, in Austria, in Germany on and on in France. So I guess I, I just want to say that on one hand, yes, the Europeans will be disappointed that the US is kind of languishing and has all these problems, but it's not as if somehow they're going to look at it with somehow, you know, clean, you know, home themselves. Other than that, it, look, it's going to take time. There's no question about it. Uh, obviously the new administration will come in and make overtures. I, I think the damage done to our reputation and it's not just Trump, although he has certainly done most of it. Uh, before Trump even arrived, the Europeans were already looking at the U.S. as a sort of a, you know, drifting away from its commitments. Obviously not in the same way, no question about that. But I guess I'm just trying to make sure we understand Trump comes along and just sort of railroads through what is already happening and, and to an extreme. And now we have to sort of turn the ship around a little bit, get back to uh, obviously the United States as a global power must be engaged and, and that engagement has to happen. There's no way around it. The US still exercises tremendous power. Uh, it is you know, still uh, going to be influencing some of the developments with Europe, the NATO alliance and, and different activities. Um, and to the extent that it is engaged, it will have a, a seat at the table. Right now it's not engaged. I mean, Trump is not dialoguing or doing any negotiation uh, other than you know, fighting them over trade issues, but there's not a lot of cooperation and coordination witness the pandemic. I mean, the, the U.S. has sort of completely jumped ship and, and that's just, it's astonishing. Uh, you know, Biden will come back, but I mean, I guess, you know, from what you're saying is if they're not going to take it seriously. Well, I think in the end, they're going to be grateful that the U.S. is back, but hoping that the U.S. also understands that it's, it's going to have to come back with a different attitude. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of attitudes, um, I, I don't know if you recall, but there was this fellow, Simon Winchester at uh, the East West Center. And he wrote a book called Pacific, and it was a different chapter for every situation, every geopolitical confluence in the Pacific. And, and one of the chapters was about the South China Seas. Um, and this was actually before it became a headline story. Uh, he isolated, he identified this. And he said, look, the, the Chinese have been, you know, they felt that they've been under our thumb for a long time. They're, they're re-emerging. They have the economic strength. They have the what do you want to call it, the political will, you know, to, to take a position, South China Seas, and they really mean it. And they're going to build islands and they're going to, you know, keep everybody else out. They're going to, they're going to you know, they're going to defend their territory or perceived territory in the China, South China Seas. And, and his lesson was this, and it, it struck me when I read this chapter because I, I was not comfortable with it. He said, the U.S. has to recognize that it's time in Asia has gone. It used to be, you know, in charge of the South China Sea. It used to be in charge of Asia after the war. Same thing like Europe, you know. We had tremendous power there, our Navy, tremendous power. Sure. But now we're, we're on defense and, um, and we're losing that. Uh, and, and Winchester made it clear that we have to learn to live with an historical international process that takes us off the top. We have, we have fallen from grace, fallen from power in Asia too. And I think that's not only so when he wrote it, but it's, it's increasingly so more. now. Absolutely. Um, so you know, what, are you, what are your thoughts about that? How do they feel about our troubles here and, and our decline arguably? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think what, what you've described, and I'm trying to remember, I think if I'm not mistaken, I read a book of his years ago that had to do with the, the journey down the Yangtze River, where he described the whole history of China in some ways. Fascinating. Uh, and, but uh, I'm, I'm curious to learn more about this one, because I think it, this theory, this idea that you've suggested around his book is very much what is happening. And that is the U.S. is having to adjust to a changing reality. And I'm not the expert on the South China Sea. I mean, obviously, as an international relations professor, I know the gist of it, but it's not my primary focus, but I would agree that the U.S. 
may have interest there, but look, those interests are evolving. You know, Taiwan, which for so many years was the you know, sort of powerful uh, treaty ally. I mean, today people are questioning, would the US come to its defense if China decided to, you know, reincorporate it or whatever, who knows? Uh, but otherwise, I, I, I guess, uh, I think it underscores how important it is to understand your history and to study it. And certainly you wanna hope that our policymakers, our diplomats, our military professionals, and I'm happy to say that I, I, I see that. I, I teach many of them and, and they, they need to understand the history uh, and not just from the US perspective. We need to know how do the Chinese, how do the Japanese, how do the Vietnamese, how do they see the world and what is their story? Because obviously there's so many dynamics going on there. You know, the role of the Chinese, which is expanding well, even in this very ambitious Belt and Road Initiative, very exciting on paper, the reality can often be a very tense, uh, you know, sort of superpower rivalry going on there, the Chinese and their influence. Well, anyway, I just think it, for all of us, it, it, it is important that we know the history and know the broad history, not just the single textbook or the view from the US, because the US has a certain view given its uh, power and weight and that it has a role there and it's always been there and so it should be there. Well, that's changing. and. Uh, and, and, you know, so I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I guess, I guess my point is we go to the table. Now I'm talking about a table in Asia, not in Europe. We go to the mm -hmm. table, American representative, and he carries with him the sense of, uh, you know, um, humility. And uh, we recognize that our position has changed, that your position, China, has changed. And we're sorry about that trade war. That was really regrettable. Uh, we, won't, we won't do that to you now. We're going to reverse that. Um, and I don't know what exact attitude our representative can take. Uh, he can say, well, you know, that was the previous administration. Uh, we, we don't think that was the right thing to do. We, we would like to have a more robust and, you know, equal to equal kind of a relationship with you. And then they look over his shoulder and they see that the Biden administration is under attack by Trump and those conservatives back in the US. So not only has the US lost you know, world standing, but the representative from the Biden administration doesn't have the support, the true support of the nation behind him. So it's a double whammy, am I right? Um, I don't think so. I, I think our diplomats are good enough and I know many of them, I've helped uh, train a few of them. Uh, that they know how to walk that dance and, and, and to play that uh, you know, role. Um, and moreover, I think that the diplomats of, and I'm speaking here maybe at the elite level, at the masses, I don't know. It just depends uh, you know, who has links or connections. But certainly the elites, whether they be you know, diplomats or business interests, um, they also know that the U.S. You know, has this sort of tradition of uh, you know, liberal, conservative, and they know that it, we're deeply divided. And I would just reassert this, Jay, we're not the only country in the world. I mean, you can look at a, a lot of other places, even neighboring Mexico today is a polarized society. Parts of Europe, we have, again, growing you know, right-wing populism in some places. So the world is deeply divided and, and the US exemplifies it and maybe takes it to another level, no doubt. But I, I have faith ultimately that uh, you know, those who represent the US interests and many of them are career diplomats. Now, some have left and you know, even our, our dear friend who you must know here, the local uh, Patrick Franco, uh, was a diplomat most recently, a former student of mine. He's now just been elected to the House of Representatives, uh, representing Kailua. Uh, and so I give him as an example because he faced this challenge as a young diplomat, you are serving the country as a whole, whoever the president is. Well, Trump came in and no doubt he pushed out a lot of our diplomats, but not all. Uh, and yet there's gonna be a continual replenishing and there are enough, I believe, career civil servants who are gonna be relieved with the transition and they will do their job effectively to go represent the interests uh, often that means explaining the puzzles of American politics, of course. But at the end of the day, I think countries, you know, there are different interests they have with the U.S. and maybe trade ties and maybe security connections. Those are going to flow and continue and they'll have their challenges, no doubt. But I, I guess I want to say that different places, different countries all have some engagement with the U.S. For some, it might be even popular culture and, you know, Hollywood and movies and whatnot. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, there's, and, there's always the American shtick, so to speak. Yeah. But I, I want to mention one other yeah. troubling scenario. Yeah, yeah. Okay, look at what happened in Hong Kong. It's really travesty how we abandoned them. Sure, um, yeah. And Trump is trying to get friendly with Taiwan. Um, and so, you know, you have this whole issue of, what do you want to call it? Trust. It's trust. Sure. So I, I go into an area, say it's Hong Kong or Taiwan, and I say, don't worry about a thing. I'm going to be with you. 
I'm going to take care of you. We're going to have a mutual arrangement of some kind, and I will be your, your defender. Um, and the question is, that the guy on the other side of the table says, thank you very much for that. But whether he says it you know, in a formal way or an informal way, or he just thinks it, he's going to say, can I, can I trust this country to make a deal with me that they're going to protect me, defend me, be my buddy, be my, you know, be my ally? Um, or am I not going to believe them? Because I find that they're, you know, whether it's trust or Biden, I'm sorry, Trump or Biden, I, I cannot trust them. Uh, isn't, haven't we lost standing in the trust department? Absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt. The U.S. has lost credibility, prestige, image, trust, all of that. No doubt. But again, I would just go back to like anything, like a personal relationship. Yeah, you can run away from it and it's all over. Or you can gradually rebuild and through action, through patience, through time. And that's where the U.S., I think it's going to take time. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight or quickly. Um, you know, even if we talk about a Biden, I mean, how long is he going to be there? Is he going to be an eight-year president? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. But obviously, the U.S. is in transition. And part of that means re-engaging with the world, trying to rebuild that trust. Not going to be easy. I, I, I certainly go back because I've had, you know, the privilege of working with some of our diplomats uh, outside of the U.S. And, uh, and help train some of them. This is the challenge they face, how to build support and trust. And, and it's through actions and through personal relations. Uh, it, depending on the culture and society you're in, I mean, you well know it with certainly with our Chinese counterparts, this notion of Guangxi. I mean, it's not there today. They're going to have to work hard to develop it. A lot of, uh, a lot of personal uh, connections that are going to have to be rebuilt. Uh, not an easy task. Uh, I certainly agree. And for that matter, you know, whoever wins the presidency, if it's Biden, uh, as we are expecting, or Trump, they're going to be facing a very challenging reality. You know, a continued pandemic, a crisis of the economy, a divided society. Well, oh, good luck. I mean, so once we finish the election, it's like it's not a piece of cake and it's going to continue to be struggling. And, and as you mentioned very much, Trump is not going to go away. He's going to, we'll see how he morphs into some other social movement or maybe some kind of media, et cetera. Uh, but that will be a factor we will continue to, uh, to deal with. Well, thank you, Carlos. I, I'm, I'm sorry, these days I always fall on the dark side of these questions. No, no, <laughs> democracy is more, working. Constructive. Democracy is working, it's messy, but in a few more days, we'll be kind of moving into the, the transition. Of course, it's unpredictable. We don't know what will happen. Donald Trump, you know, could throw more monkey wrenches and, and uh, and yet I, I, I want to have some hope that somehow our institutions and our, you know, we'll, we'll just survive this and we'll move on and life will be back to, well, again, not normal, but back to the next stage, okay? Yeah, well, I, you know, next week I want to get Alex to talk Bill on the show. And I want to ask him what he meant by the word tumultuous and whether it fits with it. His yes. definition. <laughs> these, these, these are tumultuous times by any measure, of course. So thank you. Thank you thank always you, to reconnect on this. Always, always nice to talk to you. Thank you so much. I'll see you shortly. Great. See you in two weeks. Take, Take care. care now. <laughs>